Section 14 of Roman History, the Early Empire by William Wolfe Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 6, Galba, A.D. 68 to 69. The accession of Sulpicius Galba was due to a stir of independence in the provinces. Gaul would not brook the rule of Nero longer, and the chief who came forward in the name of Vindex to maintain their liberty of choice, and whose fiery proclamations hurled Nero from his throne, called upon Galba to succeed him. He came of ancient lineage, though unconnected with the family which through natural ties or by adoption had given six emperors to Rome early omens are said to have drawn upon him as a boy the notice of augustus and tiberius he was hotly courted by the widowed agrippina and took a high place among the legatees of livia augusta in the will that was not carried out many years of his life were spent in high command in africa germany and spain where he became eminent for energy and strict discipline bordering at times on harshness till he put on a show of easy sloth to disarm the jealousy of nero the force at his command was small a single legion and two troops of horse formed but a scanty army to carry an emperor to rome his soldiers showed no great enthusiasm for him and some of his cavalry were minded even to desert him when he heard the news of the death of vindex he despaired not of success only but of life and thought of ending his career by his own hand. So far he had appealed only to the province that he ruled, had begun to levy troops and strengthen his tiny army, and to form a council of provincial notabilities to advise him like a senate. He called himself the servant only of the Roman state. But when the tidings came that the capital had accepted him for their new ruler, he took at once the name of Caesar, and put forth without disguise imperial claims rival pretenders started up at once around him in africa in germany in the quarters of the praetorian guards generals came forward to dispute the prize for every camp might have its claimant when the power of the sword would give a title to the throne but one after another fell while their soldiers wavered or deserted them so galba made his way to rome without a struggle but before him came the rumours of his harshness and his parsimony. He had sternly fined and punished the cities that were slow to recognise him, and put men to death unheard as partisans of the fallen causes. Ugly stories reappeared of the severities of earlier days, of the money-changer whose hands he had nailed to the bench where he had given false weight, of the criminal for whom he had provided in mockery a higher cross than usual, as he protested that he was a citizen of Rome. There was little to attract the people in the sight of their new prince, who entered Rome upon a litter, with hands and feet crippled by the gout, and face somewhat cold and hard, marked already with the feebleness of old age. The soldiers were the first to murmur. The marines whom Nero had called out mutinied when they were sent back to join their ships, but they were sternly checked and decimated. The imperial bodyguard of Germans was disbanded and sent back home empty-handed. The praetorians, ashamed already of the death of Nero and their prefect, heard with rage that the new sovereign would not court their favour or stoop to buy the loyalty of his soldiers. The legions on the frontier were ill-pleased to think that their voices counted for so little that they were not thought worthy of a word or promise. The German army chafed because their general Werginius had been removed on flattering pretexts, but really because his influence over them was feared, and they construed his forced absence from the camp as an insult to their loyalty and the exceptional favours shown to some towns of Gaul as a marked affront offered to themselves. Nor was the city populous in a cheerful mood. For years they had been feasted and caressed, races and games, gladiators and wild beasts had made life seem a holiday and kept them ever in good humour now they heard that there was to be an end to all such cheer for their ruler was a morose penurious old man who thought a few silver pieces awarded to the finest actor of the day a present worthy of a prince 
Nero's favourites and servants heard with rage that they must disgorge at once the plunder of the past regime. A commission was appointed to call them to account and to wrest from them what their master's prodigality had given, and as a special grace to leave them each a beggarly tithe of all the presents in which he had expended during the few years of his reign no less than two thousand one hundred million sesterces. The Senate and the men of worth and rank were full of hope at first, for Galba seemed upright and spoke them fair. But soon they found to their dismay that all influence had passed out of their hands, and that the emperor himself was not the ruling power in the state. Three favorites, one of freedmen, Icelus, two of higher rank, Tiberius Winius, his legate, and Cornelius Laco, an assessor in his court of justice, had followed him from Spain and gained, as it seemed, an absolute control over his acts. They never left him, and the wits of Rome called them the emperor's pedagogues. Indeed, they seemed to guide the old man as by the leading strings of childhood and to recall the worst days of the dotard Claudius. Public offices of trust, boons, immunities, and honors were put up shamelessly to auction, and the life and honor of free men were sacrificed to the caprice and greed of haughty and venal minions, while the most infamous of Nero's creatures, Tigellinus, was saved by their influence from the fate he merited. In a short time the discontent was universal. Already the legions of the Rhine had refused the oath of loyalty and called on the Senate and the people to choose another emperor, while in the city the temper of all classes boded ill. But Galba took one more step, and that was fatal. Feeling that at the age of seventy-three he had not strength to rule alone, he decided to adopt a colleague and successor. His choice fell on Piso Frugi Lucinianus, who was young, noble, and of eminent worth. But the act came too late to regain the confidence that had been lost, and only provoked a speedier explosion of fear, jealousy, and disaffection, the more so because the speech in which he told the soldiers of his choice was of almost disdainful brevity, and irritated minds that were still wavering and might have been won over by a little timely liberality. The blow came from the Praetorian camp, in which two common soldiers undertook to give away the throne and kept their word. A freedman had tampered with them in the interest of his master Otho, who had hoped to take the place that Piso filled, and who would now try foul means as fair had failed. The soldiers felt the temper of their comrades, and Otho's intimates and servants were lavish with their presence to the guard on all occasions. While Galba stood one morning beside the altar on which the victim lay, and the priest read presages of disaster in the entrails, Otho was beckoned suddenly away on the plea of buying an old property with the advice of his architects and builders. In the forum he found twenty-three praetorians who hurried him in a litter to their camp, and then presented him to the homage of their comrades. All were soon won over with fair words and liberal promises of bounty. The marines had not forgiven the emperor his harsh treatment of their comrades, and therefore joined the movement eagerly, while the armed forces quartered in the city made common cause with the insurgents, thrusting aside the officers who tried to hold them in. Rumors passed rapidly through Rome, meanwhile. At first men heard that the guards were up in arms against their prince, and had carried off a senator, some said Otho, to their camp. Messengers were dispatched at once by the startled rulers to secure, if possible, the obedience of other forces, while Piso appealed to the company on guard around the palace to be staunch and true, even though others wavered, and then set out to face the insurgents in the camp. Shortly after came the news that the Praetorians had slain Otho to assert their loyalty, and that they were coming to salute their sovereign. The false news spread, designedly or not, and all classes who had hesitated before streamed into the palace to make a show of joy, and to conduct Galba to the camp, while one soldier in the crowd waved in the air his sword, dripping, as he said, with Otho's blood. But the emperor, mindful of discipline to the last, said, Comrade, who bade you do the deed? At length he started after much debate and doubt, but could make little way among the densely crowded streets, and hardly reached the forum when the insurgent troops appeared in sight. They were joined at once by his single company of guards. Together they charged and dispersed the crowd that followed him, while the slaves that bore the litter flung it down upon the ground and left their master stunned and helpless and undefended to be hacked to death 
by the fierce soldiery that closed about him. So died, says Tacitus, one whom all would have thought fit for empire had he not been emperor indeed. There were many claimants for the honor of dispatching him, and Vitellius received more than one hundred and twenty letters of petition from men who looked for high reward for such a signal merit. To save the trouble of deciding, and to discourage so dangerous a precedent, he ordered all the suitors to be put to death. Piso had fled for sanctuary meantime to Vesta's temple, where a poor slave took pity on him and gave him the shelter of his hut. But the emissaries of Otho were soon upon the spot to drag him from his hiding place and slay him on the temple steps, and take his head to feast his master's eyes. The friends of the fallen rulers were allowed by special favor to buy their bodies from the soldiers and show them the last tokens of respect. End of section 14